I invite you to take your Bibles and turn into the New Testament in the Gospel of John, chapter 17. Our scripture reading is verses 1 through 5. Our sermon will focus our attention on verse 3. John 17, beginning in verse 1. Once more, this is the word of the living God, inspired, inerrant, and infallible. So let us give our attention to its reading. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we continue our examination of Jesus' prayer, that high priestly prayer offered up just a day, just hours before he would be betrayed, arrested, crucified, and hung upon the tree. In those final moments of his time together with his disciples, he desired to pray for them, but also to pray for himself. And indeed, that is the attention or, or, or the, the focus of the opening portion of his prayer. He is praying for himself. We have seen already how it is that he has prayed with regard to his own glory. He has prayed, as we saw last week, with regard to his authority. In that prayer, he spoke of the authority that was given to him over all flesh. And the purpose of that authority was so that he could give eternal life to all those who had been given to him by the Father. What becomes clear then as we examine that verse is, is, is that there was a very focused mission that Jesus was on. That he had a particular people for whom he would die. Those that had been given to him by the Father. And that the purpose of his death was to give eternal life to them. On the one hand, this kind of thankfulness on the part of the Savior is instructive. For he was focused on the glory of the Father, even as he prepared for the cross. But the fact that he prays these words in the hearing of the disciples is an encouragement for us. For as one commentator put it, God's people surely face many obstacles between grace and glory. And knowing Christ's authority is a true help for standing firm. For those first disciples, it would not be, that is a help, that is, it would, not, uh, it would not grant them strength in the time that would lead up to the cross, but filled with the Spirit at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they would persevere until the end. The same Spirit that Jesus spoke of in chapters 14 to 16, and the same Spirit who is given to all of Christ's people. Well, this morning we look at the words of Jesus in verse 3 concerning eternal life. Now, this is not the first time that Jesus has mentioned eternal life in John's gospel. In fact, we can say it has been his focus. In John 3, beginning in verse 14, Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. The author writer, that is John himself, writes in John 3, 36, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Again, Jesus has spoken of eternal life throughout his ministry. He spoke to, spoke of it to the woman at the well when he talked about the one whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Or Jesus speaking with the Pharisees and, and when they confront him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes me, who believes him who sent me, has eternal life. John 5 and verse 24. 
For in this, the will of my Father, that everyone, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. John 6 and verse 40. Or as we heard this morning in our preparation for worship in John 6, 54, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. And lastly, John 10. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Indeed, Jesus has spoken so much about eternal life that it's surprising to realize when we think about it that this is when he defines it. This is the moment that he tells us what eternal life is. This is eternal life, Jesus said. Now, on the one hand, focusing on eternal life throughout John's gospel makes sense since this is the purpose for the incarnation. But on the other hand, we tend to think of eternal life simply as a length of time. That is, we think of eternal life with regard to quantity. That is, infinite life, life that never ends. And surely Jesus' death, uh, death and resurrection secures this kind of life. After all, Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Or, or, or John, the apostle, will see in his vision in Revelation 21 and verse 4, and, 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 and he will say these words, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. The quantity of life surely is at least part of eternal life. This, of course, is what Jesus said when, 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 when Lazarus had died. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. But the truth is that all will live forever. This is confirmed by Scripture. We are created as embodied souls, and our bodies and souls will be united in the resurrection for eternity, whether in the presence of God's glory and love or in the presence of his wrath. Whether you're talking about destruction or glory, both are described as eternal in Scripture. As the psalmist declares, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. So I don't think that Jesus is speaking here about the quantity of life, but rather the quality of life. And he makes clear that this is eternal life. Knowing God, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We'll consider this morning three things. First, the importance of eternal life. Secondly, the sum of eternal life. And thirdly, the present possession of eternal life. So first, the importance of eternal life. We can start, we can think, with a, with a contrast. In other words, in order to understand what Jesus is speaking of here with regard to eternal life, we, we need to understand that, that apart from Christ, that we are all in death. That is, until we are enlightened by God. That is, until we are brought to a saving knowledge of Christ by the work of the Spirit. For He is life. To understand rightly then what Jesus speaks of here we, as eternal life, we must remember that death is not part of life. When God created man, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, it was for eternal life. Death is a part of the curse, part of the fall. Remember that, 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 that the, the command was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day in which you eat of it, you will surely die. And we know how that story went. They ate of it. And so what happens? There was still the tree of life there in the garden. And so God drives them out. In Genesis 3, verses 22 to 24. Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. 
That, of course, was a mercy, lest man be forever in a state of death. That is a spiritual death, ending, of course, in physical death, but an eternal death. Indeed, the words of Genesis 3 highlight for us what it is that this spiritual death brought about alienation from God because of sin. This leads ultimately to what Scripture refers to as the second death, which is permanent separation from God's love and grace, even His common love and His common grace that unbelievers find in this world. Death, of course, is the lot of all apart from Christ. This is how the Scriptures speak. It is the, nat- it is the state of natural man. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is the state of natural man, that is, death. And so Jesus says that he comes to give eternal life. Remember that this eternal life is not something that is earned. This is clear throughout the gospel narrative that we've been studying together in John over these past two years. It is a gift that is to be a, that is obtained. This is the purpose for Christ's incarnation is to bring eternal life and not just to bring it, but to secure it for us. For in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, John said in one, chapter 1 and verse 4. The life that we need is inherent in Jesus. And this is the life that he brings. And the way he would bring eternal life is through his own right standing before the Father. In other words, as sentimental as some might try to make the incarnation out to be, it is only part of Christ obtaining for us eternal life. He would need to live a a life of perfect obedience and then die the cursed death for our sake. This is how he obtains eternal life, through his perfect obedience and his death upon the cross. And that's why he is the one who can give eternal life. For if our deserving is eternal condemnation, how do we come to possess eternal life? It is not as though everybody is born in a neutral state, and so long as they don't do enough bad, then they're going to be okay. So long as they respond to the light that they might have, then everything's fine. No, Jesus makes clear that it is focused upon the one true God, and in Him, Jesus Christ. The only way we can come to possess eternal life is by way of a gift from God. For remember how Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. He said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. This is because Jesus is the source of eternal life. 1 John 5, verses 11 and 12, we read, And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Or as Paul sums it up so well in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Eternal life must be a gift that is obtained by Christ and given by Christ. And that is the good news, that that is precisely why he has come. Remember last week, he has come and now has authority to give eternal life to all those who have been given to him by the Father. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The sum of eternal life is knowing God. The sum of eternal life is knowing Jesus Christ. That is, knowing God through Jesus Christ. One cannot know God apart from Christ. There is no knowledge of God that is true, saving knowledge of God apart from Jesus Christ. What does it mean to know God? 
The Greek word that is used here, gnosko, carries with it several nuances. On the one hand, it can make reference to cognitive knowledge. That is, at its most basic level, gnosko refers to intellectual knowledge, or as we would say, just the facts. It is used to express that understanding of facts, information, or concepts. But this is an essential component of knowledge. Anyone who tries to argue that knowledge of facts is unnecessary is open to any number of misbeliefs when it comes to God. And how do we get this knowledge? Scripture shows us two ways in which we receive or come to know things of God. The first, of course, is general revelation. That is, knowledge of God in creation. Romans 1, verses 20 to 23, we read, For the invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. The Apostle Paul uses the very same word that Jesus does here when it comes to the fact that they knew God. That is, knowing God is eternal life. And so Paul is saying that they knew God. Now, again, he's not saying that they had eternal life. But this is that cognitive aspect of knowledge. That they knew things about God. That is, when we look at creation, we can see the, 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 the divine attributes of God. We can see His power. We can see His glory and His beauty. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork, David writes in Psalm 19. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. David is saying that creation cries out the reality of God. There is no way to silence that. Indeed, the Apostle Paul says that what man must do is that he must suppress that knowledge in unrighteousness and essentially replace God with something else to be worshipped, usually from among the creation or at least from his own mind. There is general revelation. But that is not what we are talking about necessarily when we think about how we come to know or, or knowing things about God. Of course, we can look at creation around us and we can know certain things. Indeed, the more that we actually know God, the more that we can see his handiwork in creation. And although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men unexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of His will which is necessary unto salvation. And this is why God has given to us His Word. This is why the Apostle John is writing down the words of Jesus and the actions and the life of Jesus in order that we might have special revelation. It would not suffice to simply have general knowledge of God, but rather the knowledge of God as a loving and caring Creator and Savior who gave His Son. Again, the Apostle Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 13 and 14. We impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And so we say that when it comes to our knowledge of God, that we can understand things from the creation around us, but we understand them especially as given to us in the Scriptures. This is where we turn to understand, as I said in our Old Testament reading, to understand how it is that we worship God according to His Word. But it is in His Word that, of course, we learn about who we are and who He is and how it is that we are to be saved. But even still, you could memorize the entirety of Scripture and throw in the Catechism for good measure. And that is not the totality of knowledge that Jesus speaks of. In other words, it's not just the facts 
that Jesus is talking about. The facts are important, but it's not just the facts. As John Calvin says, he says almost every one of the words in Jesus' words in verse 3 has its weight. For it is not every kind of knowledge that is here described, but that knowledge which forms us anew into the image of God from faith to faith, or rather which is the same with faith, by which, having been engrafted into the body of Christ, we are made partakers of the divine adoption and heirs of heaven. It is not merely cognitive knowledge, but a personal knowledge of God. For the term that, Paul, that, that, that John uses, or that Jesus uses here, can also convey a deeper personal knowledge that comes through direct experience or relationship. For instance, in John 10 and verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. This goes beyond mere factual knowledge to relational, intimate knowledge. That is, as we say in our shorter catechism question for the first commandment this morning, that we would know and acknowledge God as our God. Human knowledge of God may be a purely intellectual thing, as one knows about God through observing the results of his actions. But God's people know him in a personal way. And again, this is borne out in Scripture elsewhere. Remember in Luke's Gospel, in chapter 4, when Jesus is casting out demons, and they say to him, You are the Son of God. He rebuked them. But they were speaking the truth. They knew who Jesus was. They had knowledge. James would say it this way, You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. J.C. Ryle says, he says, the knowledge he means is a knowledge which dwells in the heart and influences the life. A true saint is one who knows the Lord. To know God on the one hand, his holiness, his purity, his hatred of sin, and to know Christ, his redemption, his mediatorial office, his love to sinners. These are the grand foundations of saving faith. Knowing God. This is the sum of eternal life. Indeed, it is the sum of eternal life so much that Jesus says that you must know God in Him. That they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Knowledge of Jesus Christ, knowledge of God in Jesus Christ, is essential. Again, this is borne out throughout the Scriptures. For Jesus is the one who comes from heaven to earth in order to save his people from their sins. He is truly the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Throughout the Old Testament, we would read of various individuals who would be anointed like kings and priests. They would be anointed with oil as a symbol of being set apart for a special purpose. But Jesus is the fulfillment, the fullness of the ultimate anointed one chosen by God for his unique and significant mission. He would come and establish his reign. He would come and save his people from their sins. This is the story of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Everything that we're talking about with regard to eternal life then is the sum and substance of our hope in Jesus. For he is the one who was anointed he is the one who is set apart. And we have been set apart in Him. Indeed, the significance of Jesus' words here in citing Himself as the one who is sent by the one true God is that He is equal with the Father. And what's more, that our eternal life is bound up in Him. That as He lives, so we live. And this again is how we find it referenced throughout the scriptures. In 2 Corinthians 4, 6, Paul says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Or as he says again in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Our life is so bound up with Christ that, 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 that all that we are and all that we do is wrapped up in who He is, in His life, His death, and His resurrection. This is the significance of our baptism as we reflect upon it from time to time. That we were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into, our de- into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life, Paul writes in Romans 6 and verse 4. In Romans 8, verses 10 and 11, he says, But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through a Spirit who dwells in you. This is eternal life. To know God and to know Christ. Here we see how our eternal life then is focused completely, bound up completely with Jesus. Focused completely upon God's glory. No wonder we can hold such doctrines as the assurance of salvation. Because our salvation ultimately is not about what we have done or how well we have done it. Do we not, do we not know, beloved, that were we to place, our, place the assurance of our salvation upon our own deeds, that there would be no hope for assurance. You know, the only way that we can have assurance is because it's focused upon God's glory and upon Christ. This is why we are reminded week after week to lift up our hearts to heaven. Or as Paul says in Colossians 3, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, and you also will appear with Him in glory. This also is why it is that which must be received by faith. To trust in Jesus Christ and to receive that eternal life by His Spirit. That eternal life that He secures. This is eternal life. That they know You, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom You have sent. But that leaves a very big implication for us this morning. For if all we think about eternal life is it's, is, is, is it's that, that pie in the sky, it's that thing that happens after death, then no wonder we can put it off in our minds and focus completely upon the things of this world. But if eternal life is, as Jesus says, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of Christ, then it's something we have right now. Indeed, as the Apostle Paul will say, that the Spirit is the deposit, the guarantee of that glory hereafter. But the reality is that because of the Spirit, we have eternal life now. And I want us to think about this in our closing today. Our possession of eternal life. That is our present possession. And it begins, of course, with our knowledge of God. That He is the only true God. That He is the one that we turn to. This is, of course, what we look at in the first commandment. Psalm 16, verses 4 and 5, we read, The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. And their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. The first commandment calls us to see that God is the one true God and our God. That He is the only true God. That apart from Him, there is no other God. It is He we worship. It is He we trust in. But that knowledge goes deeper, doesn't it? It's not just our knowledge of God, but it's our knowledge of His love for us. Again, hear the words of 1 John 4. We've already heard them, but in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. The knowledge of God, the knowledge of God's love is a comfort and a help. Jeremiah says, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. 
the knowledge of God and the knowledge of His love for us is to be, of course, a comfort and a help. But it is even the, pos- the present possession of eternal life that we have at this time. And of course, when we think of God's, of our knowledge for God, we can't help but rem- be reminded that what matters most is His knowledge of us. Galatians 4, 9, we read, But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19 says, But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. So J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God, says this, What matters supremely, therefore, is not, in the last analysis, the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, the fact that He knows me. I am graven on the palms of His hands. I am never out of his mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. What stands behind the knowledge of God, of course, is the knowledge uh, of our knowledge of God is God's knowledge itself. Secondly, our knowledge of Christ That is, the present possession of eternal life is our knowledge of God, but also our knowledge of Christ, for He is the supreme revelation of God. And in this, again, is bound up all of our hope and all of our happiness. For it is in our knowledge of Christ that we have reconciliation with God. It is in our knowledge of Christ that we have access to God. It is our knowledge of Christ that we are being conformed into His image. And we are given all of the spiritual blessings, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, all of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. They are all ours. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 3, verses 8 to 10, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. All that we have and all that we are is bound up then in our knowledge of God and our knowledge of Christ. All of the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And the knowledge that we have of Him is a knowledge which grows. It begins now, but it grows for eternity. And it can grow for an eternity because, because God is eternal. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever, you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. And this is how we come to reconcile the, the, the quality of, of knowing God with the quantity, or I should say, the quality of eternal life with the quantity of eternal life. For we will never come to the end of knowing God. It is never going to be, there will never be a point, whether now or in eternity, that we can sit back and say, I have God figured out. I know all that there is to know about Him. Indeed, in eternity, we will never grow tired of knowing God. What is begun now, what is given now, is carried on forever. This is why we speak to people about Christ and eternal life. For we want, him, we want them to know Him as well. For this life is not all that there is. Indeed, there is an eternity to be lived after. How will it be spent? It will either be spent knowing the one true God through Jesus Christ or being separated from Him forever. Jesus gives eternal life.